Thank you, Senator Burke. Well, good morning, and thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, it's refreshing to have a legislative markup, I might say. This legislation before us is a true milestone in recognizing lessons learned during our nation's pandemic response. And the Chair and I want to thank each of our colleagues for their efforts to bring us to this markup today. I'm pleased that the committee is building on the bipartisan foundation of three decades worth of work to enhance the preparedness policies that our country has relied on to respond to this terrible pandemic. My friends, we should remember that this committee last acted on preparedness legislation in May of 2018 to reauthorize the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Act. While we knew it was an important bill at the time, we had no idea just how much our work then would impact our daily lives now. When COVID-19 first arrived in the United States two years ago, Congress responded in a bipartisan and unprecedented way to bring relief to Americans and to shore up our country's response. In my 27 years in Congress, I've rarely seen this body move so quickly, an extremely difficult task. The work of this committee was the foundation of the government's response. Our committee must once again step up to the task of considering legislation that will help us better prepare against future threats. All of us on this committee have spent countless hours compiling policies that drive at one point. How do we do it better next time? I'm proud of the work we've done together. The Prevent Pandemics Act is a very good bill. The central issue facing us today is how can we better anticipate what threat we'll face next and innovate quickly enough to rise to the challenge? The future, unfortunately, is hard to predict. I introduced one of my first pieces of preparedness legislation in 2001. At the time, I knew we needed rapid medical response teams to surge for emergency events. So I wrote a bill to create the National Medical Disaster Medical System, which still plays a key role in surging to address pockets of, with high COVID cases across the country. One of those teams was just sent to North Carolina six weeks ago. What I've learned is that when we write preparedness legislation, we don't always know what our tools will be used for, but we know that they'll need them. Over the last two years, we've learned that more effective leadership is needed to direct and coordinate the work of federal departments during a response. So we've created the White House Mission Control Office to bring a unified whole of government approach to responses and to keep us sharp during peacetime. During each of our hearings, members on both sides of the aisle rightfully challenged CDC for their actions, confusion, confusing directives, and inability to provide realistic guidance to Americans. Through this bill, we're putting into place real, meaningful reforms that take important steps to improve the culture of CDC, while desperately, uh, which desperately needs changing. Along with cultural reforms at CDC, the modernization of public health data and surveillance cap capabilities will be key in provide, providing early warning signs of the next threat we face. I especially appreciate the works of Senator Cassidy, Romney, Higginlooper, and Kane to bring these capabilities into the 21st century. Senators Cassidy, Romney, Collins, Marshall, Smith, Hassan identified critical gaps in our medical supply capabilities. So we're adding new tools to engage states and private industry in stockpiling and ensuring we maintain a warm base for countermeasure uh, manufacturing. Senators Marshall, Braun, and Paul helped to highlight vulnerabilities in our research enterprise. This legislation brings a new strategy to federal high, high containment labs in the United States, reforms our approach to overseeing federally funded research with high risk pathogens, and protects American innovation against the efforts of our adversaries to steal our discoveries. The historic success of Operation Warp Speed illustrated the importance of countermeasure research. Senators Higginlooper, Braun, and Kane worked to incorporate provisions in, to ensure access to virus samples to help bring tests, treatments, and vaccines to Americans in record time. The FDA stood out as a success among our public health agencies, leaning heavily on its emergency authorities. This committee provided them. The bill builds on that success, creating a new de designated pathway for platform technologies to support the technology which we saw create life-saving vaccines and therapeutics 
and a program to support advanced manufacturing technologies, an effort led by Senator Scott and Rosen. Senator Scott has also championed policies to encourage broader use of innovative and adaptive clinical trial designs which are included in this bill. Ultimately, we learned that countless lives were saved because of new creative partnerships with the private sector. This bill preserves and encourages these partnerships so that next time they're not stood up on the fly, but well-established, well-oiled agreements with innovative partners. My colleagues worked on many more provisions included in this legislation, all with the same preparedness focus for threats of tomorrow. With this bill, Americans can rest assured that we'll be ready with better tools, better partners, stronger workforce, and more leadership for the next threat we face together. I was pleased to also work with the chair to authorize ARPA-H so that we establish a framework by which to advance breakthrough technologies that will revolutionize biomedical science. By partnering with innovators across sectors and fostering an environment where innovation is the norm, I hope this will result in the discovery of platform technologies to treat and cure many diseases. Our manager's amendment makes many important improvements to the bill we introduced last week and adds many of your important priorities to make this legislation stronger. I appreciate the work of you and your staff to make these improvements. As we open this bill up for amendments and debate, I'd like to ask my colleagues to resist the temptation to add legislation that does not relate to preparedness policies in this bill. This legislation should stay focused on the important task at hand. I look forward to working with you to continue to improve the bill both here in committee and as we work to move the bill to the Senate floor and hopefully to the House. My hope is the President will be able to sign the bill into law as soon as possible. I might add to my comments, uh, Madam Chairman, uh, I think on this side of the aisle we agree that more funding is needed, but also is more information. I've tried for months to get this administration um, not unlike the last administration, to provide details to oversight committees. There's no reason that this committee shouldn't understand how many vaccines do we currently have in inventory? How many therapeutics do we have in inventory? Uh, how many home tests do we have in inventory? These are reasonable things for a committee to, to, to know. For us to make educated decisions about spending, we have to create a baseline. COVID came with a pace that didn't allow us to establish a baseline of what we had. None of us knew what was in the national stock, uh, stockpile. None of us knew who was in charge. These are all things that we've got time to sort out now. And, and understanding what our inventories are, are, uh, are right now, understanding what our intentions are about purchase orders in the future, that's what oversight is about. To starve this committee of that level of granularity Quite frankly, uh, it needs to change. So funding is going to be conditional on the willingness to share with the Committee of Oversight some of those specifics that aren't just for this side of the aisle, they're for all of us to make educated decisions, to call into question, like we have on occasion, guidance that came out of an agency and said, where's the data to, to back this up? Um, listen, it's healthy for us to take data produced by the government and to test it with academia to see if they interpret it the same way. If you don't release the data, that can't happen. But it's healthy for the process for that to happen. Just like for 20 years, we never accepted foreign data for a, a, an FDA application. COVID, we did. And you know what? That's the reason we were a, able to hit the one-year mark. We should encourage the continuation of foreign data to be part of applications. Um, these are all things that the committee needs to know to make the best policy decisions, but to also make the strategic funding decisions of the future. So, Madam Chairman, I thank you for the long hours and hard work that have gone into this bill. What we're doing is important, and it reflects the best traditions of this committee. I yield back.